Good afternoon, and thank you for having me. I'm going to talk about the practical issues in litigation and arbitration in the post-pandemic world. Now, as we know, the pandemic has devastated countries the world over. But the question is, is there a silver lining? As the pandemic continues to rage in many countries and in others where it begins to recede, in the legal sphere, we constantly look for that silver lining. Now, as we know, technological advancement has taken on indeed made great steps even prior to the pandemic. The pandemic, however, has accelerated some of the trends in that technological space and has indeed perhaps been the impetus for very much change. As the saying goes, necessity is the mother of invention. But then what does the road ahead look like? Are we looking at a new normal in the sense that we are looking at something reasonably stable or a new dynamic where change is the only constant and indeed where the world ahead will be in a constant change of flux. I'm going to talk about hearings, virtual, physical, or somewhere in between, as well as witness testimony, which is perhaps the heart and soul of your evidential hearing. I'm then going to talk about case management and cost management and how the pandemic may have implications or changes on how we manage cases. All of that is primarily procedural. And we're then going to talk about the emerging trends in the subject matter of disputes in the substantive sense. So hearings, virtual, physical, or somewhere in between. Now we've of course heard a lot about hearings and virtual hearings in particular. So what is the optimal balance? Is it a case of one size fits all, or more aptly, one size fits none, where there is a default, perhaps being a physical or virtual hearing? Or will the analysis be primarily on a case by case basis? There are a couple of considerations. The first would be the regulatory framework. In other words, what sort of legislative framework and what sort of rules are in play. Now, most of the arbitral rules do not define the evidentiary hearing so narrowly so as to exclude a virtual hearing. But perhaps in the future, there will be a little bit more wrapped around that so that we've got greater clarity as to what is a hearing in this post-pandemic world. Perhaps tribunals or indeed parties may take the lead and set up early in the arbitral process what sort of hearing they would look at. It might be the case where we would have hybrid options and that sort of flexibility would probably be something that would have to be deserved. And then what new frontiers are there when it comes to the question of challenges to arbitral awards. Now, as we know, an arbitral award can be challenged on the basis that principles of natural justice were not adhered to. For example, where one side has not had the full and proper opportunity to present its case or the right to be heard, that raises questions of natural justice. Now, in the recent decision of CBS versus CBP, the Singapore Court of Appeal, our Apex Court, set aside an award due to the tribunal's refusal to convene an evidentiary hearing when one of the parties expected one. Now, that same question might arise where the tribunal decides to convene perhaps a virtual hearing 
in place of a physical one. And perhaps the guidance given by the Court of Appeal in that case might apply. So the Court of Appeal asked, what would a reasonable and fair-minded tribunal do in those given circumstances? Now, virtual hearings, of course, have been around for some time. And the case of Sino Dragon Trading versus Noble Resources, an Australian decision, an Australian decision, the question as to whether technical issues which arose in the course of that virtual hearing would amount to a case where the witness did not have the proper opportunity to present evidence. Now, the Federal Court of Australia declined to set aside the award in that particular instance. And we're likely to see more of this as we have more virtual hearings. We then come to the core of the evidential hearing, reframing reliability. Now, witness testimony is needless to say, very important in an evidential hearing, but how much weight should be placed on the testimony of a witness when there are documents in play? And perhaps how much should we place on witness demeanor, particularly when every expression, every facial expression, the way in which a witness presents a case is magnified in a virtual hearing. Now, the starting point seems to be that seeing a witness full face in color and in a live, in a live conference facility is as good as, if not better than seeing a witness in a traditional courtroom. However, because there is an inherent bias in human nature, in the way in which we look at witnesses and read into their demeanor with these issues magnified, will virtual hearings perhaps present a greater risk. Ultimately, the trial judge has to consider the totality of evidence in determining the veracity, reliability, and credibility of a particular witness's evidence. This includes contemporaneous objective documentary evidence. That was the guidance provided by the Court of Appeal in Sand Solution, which indeed echoes the trend or indeed the jurisprudential thinking and general approach to witness evidence. Because it is inherently unreliable and the better performing witness may not necessarily be the honest one, the trial judge at the tribunal would have to be judicious and careful to assess that evidence. How much more when those facial expressions where the wit are magnified and the witness is really up close for scrutiny by the tribunal and indeed the parties. I then move on to a new area, case management and cost management. How is that going to change? Well, when we have virtual hearings, presumably there is going to be some form of cost saving. Witnesses who are based overseas presumably would not need to travel for the hearing or indeed for case management or witness preparation purposes. And the question is, should this entail a paradigm shift on our part? I've picked up a sample clause which states, the arbitral tribunal should consider conducting hearings remotely where possible. And unless there are good reasons why a physical hearing is, is necessary, take into account all the circumstances of the case. This clause sets the default as a virtual one, where if a physical hearing is needed, then the circumstances would have to justify it. I raise this really to ask the question, 
Is this the way forward? And that brings us to the next question. When we talk about recovery and cost principles, where, for example, in arbitration, the norm is to recover whatever cost has been reasonably incurred if an award of cost is granted in your favor, could the other side then say, in your particular case, you ought not to have called the witnesses down for witness preparation. They ought not to have traveled when those uh, meetings could have been done virtually. And indeed, what do we do when witnesses have virtual hearings or, or attend virtually, but some of that preparation has to be remote? Would that sort of cost be recoverable, recoverable in this new pandemic world? From the procedural front, we move to some of the subject matter issues, the more substantive. And what are the emerging trends that one may see or discern in this new post-pandemic era? The pandemic, as we know, has hit traditional industries very hard. And out of that, it is likely, and indeed we are seeing this, there are increasing issues which arise, disputes which arise, and further litigation likely flows from that sector. In similar vein, because all sectors and industries have been badly hit, there is an increase in restructuring, insolvency, and bankruptcy on a number of different fronts particularly in the hardest hit sectors. And then we see a rise of tech disputes. Tech, of course, is the next big thing, but it comes with issues, potential disputes, and indeed cybersecurity and data, issue, data issues, which have fast arisen. Now, if we look at data-related crime, there has been a sharp rise in online and digital crimes from 2019 to 2020. And that's solely due to the increase in online scam cases. E-commerce scams are at the top of the, are the top scam type with the highest number reported in 2020, increasing by 19.1% from 2019 to 3,354 cases. Banking-related phishing scams increased by 1,578 percent to 100. I'm sorry, 1,342 cases, and non-banking phishing scams increased by another whopping number, 1,214 percent to 644 cases. So, indeed, if this is indicative of the type of disputes which have come out of the technological advancements, which we're seeing more and more of in this virtual uh, age and in this post-pandemic era, that appears to be one very clear trend which is likely to arise and which is likely to persist. So that leaves me to thank you, and I'm happy to take any questions that you may have. Thank you very much.